Jesus said, Man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You're listening to Daily Truth. Titus chapter 2 specifically says you know, that older women should train younger women, that they should teach them to be submissive to their husbands, lovers of children, not slanderous or given to much wine. But another thing that Titus 2 specifically references is that older women should train younger women to be workers at home. Men and women are both called to work. The distinction is not that men are called to work and that women are not. The distinction is where. That's the distinction. My wife works, and she works hard. At times, I feel as though she may have days that she works harder than I do. Not always. There are times that I work harder than she does because I don't like that misconception either, right? Husbands, when you get home, help your wife with the dishes. There are times when a husband should help his wife with the dishes. What I don't like about that is it presupposes that a man is leaving the house to relax. No, a man is leaving the house to work and he comes home tired because he's been working and giving himself to provide for the well-being of that family. So I think that we can exalt women without having to poke fun at men every chance we get. That's why we're in the problem that we're in. C point A, worshiping women. Uh, no, men, men are worthy of honor. Right? Happy wife, happy life. Happy man comes home again. Try that one. <laughs> Try a household that doesn't have a man where he's left. And the scripture speaks to that. Better to be living on the corner of a roof than to be married to a nagging wife. Men are not inherently more sinful than women. Women are not inherently more sinful than men. But I do have serious concerns and questions about a society and culture that coddles the sin of women for decades and belittles men every chance it gets what effect would that have long term? And to pretend pretend that it has no effect at all, I I think is naive. So honor your father and mother, the generation above you. That's one generation. Um, Men working to the point where your wives can be keepers at home. Again, I think that that's something that requires a little bit of a disclaimer in today's society. Um, Sin Sin has consequences all across the board, meaning that sin has, sin at the societal level has consequences even economically. So economically, right right now, our economy is geared in such a way that it is incredibly difficult to financially function with a one-income family. And this is the result of feminism. It is. It's the fault of feminism. Feminism sought to liberate women from the shackle of being wives and mothers and tied to the home. And what it has accomplished is that a lot of women come to find out, start to realize later in life that they actually want to be wives and mothers, and they can't. They've missed the window of fertility chronologically, or economically, they simply cannot afford to have a single-income family because of feminism. And so men have to work extra hard. There was a time in our nation where the average job that was filled by a man would allow you to own a home. You wouldn't have some of the luxuries that we have, right? So I don't want to overplay it prior generations live more frugally than we do. So we need to give them credit in that regard. Right? They weren't spending $5 a day at Starbucks on a coffee. They were drinking Folgers. It was cheap. It was gross. But it picked them up and gave them the energy they needed to get the job done. And they had one car, not two. And they didn't do four weeks of vacation. But they could own a home. They could own a car. And they could provide for a family with a wife and children on one income. 
And the husband didn't have to be an engineer. He didn't have to be a rocket scientist. He didn't have to be a doctor in order to do that. The average husband would be able to produce that amount of wealth to care for his family. We currently do not live in that time. I I sometimes get angry when I think of all the Christian messages that come out of America that talk about, well, they say Americans are so rich. We're the richest people in the history of humanity. We're the richest people on the planet. Um, There are more than one way. There's more than one way to measure wealth. You can measure wealth in terms of convenience and comfort. In that regard, uh, you think of kings of old. Um, A king would have at his disposal, let's say Pharaoh, for example, at his disposal, magi, scholars, scribes, learned men, counselors. You have an iPhone. And it produces more information and depending how much discernment you have with your searches, more accurate information than all of the wise and learned men in Egypt could provide for Pharaoh. Pharaoh had teams of dancers and entertainers. You have a flat screen TV. Pharaoh, as he was sleeping during summer months when it was hot, would have slaves and servants fanning his bed. You have HVAC. Teams of chariots and horses. You have a minivan. So in those terms, which are usually the terms that we think of, and here's the problem, they're usually the only terms of wealth that we think of. And in those terms, we say, oh, we're so rich. Americans are so rich. And guys like David Platt write books like Radical, which is a terrible book. That's why we're in the problem we're in right now. Because you forfeit all the major institutions, all for global missions. You lose every ounce of influence as the people of God. And the culture digresses and spirals and becomes worse and worse and worse. And for the record, David Platt lives in a $950,000 house in the D.C. area. There's nothing wrong with that, for the record. There's nothing wrong with living in a $950,000 house. But you can't live in a $950,000 house and write the book Radical. You can't do both. That's what's wrong. You could be Dave Ramsey and write a book about storing up wealth and live in a $3 million house. But you can't write to Christians telling them to give up everything and then live in a $950,000 house. That's called lying. The prosperity gospel is a heresy that damns millions of souls to hell, but the the poverty gospel is doing us no favors in the American church today. So convenience is one way. Comfort is one way to measure wealth. You know another way to measure wealth? The chief way, the measurement that's been used in virtually every culture throughout all of human history? Ownership. What do you own? Abraham didn't have air conditioning, but he had land, livestock, servants. He actually owned something. You have Netflix and air conditioning, plumbing, running water and electricity. And what's your net worth? You can't own a home because you can't get across the threshold for a down payment? Not all of you, but some of you. You don't have retirement. Not really. You have a promise of social security, and you know that's a joke. Because people haven't reproduced enough to keep that coffer filled. And you're actually raising kids, which that's what's going to be paying social security, for all the liberals that have cats and dogs. Think about that. Your kids are going to pay for the medical insurance for that person, that blue-haired feminist who's 35 right now who hates kids and hates your kids. And she's going to be financially upheld 
by the sweat of your children. You'll own nothing and be happy. You'll eat the bugs. Yeah, in one sense, we're wealthy. Convenience, comfort. But in another sense, we're, we are a, a hundred times poorer than Israel. Remember, Israel, before they left Egypt, they plundered Egypt of all its gold. Now, the problem is when people become suddenly rich and they don't understand how to manage wealth, you make bad investments. In the case of Israel, they plundered all the gold, they invested it in a calf, and then were forced to grind it to dust and drink it. So that wealth accumulation didn't help very much, you know, but they were rich. They owned things. And they had an inheritance, something that they could actually leave to future generations. So because of sin, sin has consequences. There is a fruit of righteousness. There is a fruit of wickedness, a fruit of sin. And because of sin, and particularly the sin of feminism and its multifaceted effect, particularly on economies and markets, all of a sudden, Titus 2, women working at home, at least during that stage of life when the children are young and need nurturing, has become exceedingly difficult. But the point is, again, that's just one more commandment in Scripture. That's not a suggestion. It's a commandment in Scripture. It's something that you should be working towards. I understand that not all of you have achieved it. My wife has worked part-time out of our home for our entire marriage until Franklin was born. And by God's grace, she's not going back. We're done. But it took us a long time to get there. And so I'm not trying to be heavy-handed. But the question is, are you working towards that? And if you are working towards that, then you feel the resistance. You recognize this is costly. All right, all right, all right. Stop twisting my arm. I know you want to hear the inside scoop. Here it is. The glorious vision of Right Response Ministries for the first half of next year, 2023. We have not one, not two, but three massive endeavors that we will accomplish by the grace of of God. The first you already know about. It's our Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference. This is selling out incredibly fast. By the time this commercial airs, you may not even be able to get a ticket. I, I, I really don't know. So don't waste another moment. Go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com to join us for the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference next year. Now, this is where you come in. We need your help. Our next two endeavors are number one, a documentary style film, and number two, a brand new studio. Both of these things are seeking to accomplish one primary goal, which is excellent, high quality, glorious Christian media. We are tired of, of as Christians, doing things poorly. We've done our best with what we have, but by God's grace, we want to do even better. This is not going to be just another video. This is not going to be a sermon or an interview or a podcast, but we're going to make a documentary style film. And we're going to be hiring Nathan Anderson, the director of On Earth As It Is In Heaven, a very, very successful post-millennialism documentary that's on Amazon and YouTube, came out a couple years ago. He's going to be flying in from Chile to help us direct this film. And our documentary is going to be on postmillennialism and theonomy, why it's biblically valid, why it's absolutely necessary, and why, by the grace of God, theonomy and postmillennialism are currently on the rise. So we're going to make this film, and we need your support. And not just this film, but we're going to make all of our videos and podcasting and everything we do here at Right Response Ministries better. We want to achieve the highest level of quality and Christian excellence that we possibly can. That's where the new studio comes in. This new film, our, our date that we're shooting for is that it would be complete and publicly available in May or June of 2023, next year. The studio, our goal is that it would be completely done in its construction and the equipment and the setup and the stage and everything by January, February of 2023 next year. We need your prayers. We need your encouragement. 
And for those of you who are willing to do so, we need your generous support. You can give towards these endeavors by going to rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Again, that's rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Thank you so much for all your help. God bless.